Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated, it truly, truly is. Before we get started, let me give you my usual disclaimer. This video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions. Next, if you have not liked, subscribed, or comment it yet, please consider doing so. It really helps me out and I really, really appreciate it. Plus, I love hearing from you guys and I try to get back to as many of you as I can. Last and probably most importantly, there is a trigger warning on this one because it does deal with teen unaliving. So take that into consideration before deciding to move forward. Okay, and with that, let's get started. So today we're talking about 20-year-old Renee Marsden. She was born on October 15th, 1992 to parents Teresa and Jamie. When she was about two years old, her parents would decide to separate. When she was five years old, her mother began dating a man named Mark Madsen, and a year later they would be living together. They would get married, and then Renee would end up taking his name. Mark and Teresa would also go on to have three more children together, Luke, Jake, and Monique. Renee's first love was a man named Angus Young. He described her as a bubbly person who always looked on the bright side of life, a glass-is-half-full type of person beautiful, kind, and very down to earth. These two met because Renee was actually working at a hair salon that Angus went to for haircuts. He finally got the nerve to ask her out and the two would begin dating and fall in love around April of 2010. They would talk about how they were going to get married, have four kids, and a Labrador. He would say that being with her was the best time of his life. Unbeknownst to him, Renee's best friend, I say that very loosely, since the ninth grade was Camilla Zidon. She was bad-mouthing Angus behind his back and encouraging Renee to break things off with him. She would tell Renee that he didn't love her and that he was only using her for sex. As the relationship between Angus and Renee grew, the relationship between Renee and Camilla began to deteriorate. That's when Camilla began to call Renee repeatedly and show up at her work uninvited to speak to her. Renee's mother tells a story about how her and Renee were in the library one day and Camilla shows up. She corners Renee and tells her, as long as you don't answer my phone calls, I will continue to follow you. Single eye female. Another time, the girls went out to a cafe with both of their mothers. Renee tried to break off the friendship. And once again, Camilla became irate and started yelling at her saying, you don't mean it, you don't mean it. Teresa, Renee's mother, had to get in between the girls so that her daughter could get outside of the restaurant. Then once they were outside, Camilla chased her down and got in her face again. So again, Teresa had to get in between the girls so that her daughter could get into the car. Even after this encounter, Camilla would continue to call Renee repeatedly. Most of the calls she would ignore, but some of them she would answer. Renee would end up confiding in her cousin Stephanie a lot about her friendship with Camilla. When Renee was still in high school, she told Stephanie that Camilla tried to kiss her a few times, and sometimes she was violent about it, and sometimes she was trying to seduce her. She would push her, punch her, and cause bruises to her. Another time she confided in her cousin that Camilla chased her down the hallway, grabbed her hair, and pulled it. And even though Stephanie was sworn to secrecy, she told this information to Renee's mother, as she should. When Teresa confronted her daughter about these allegations, Renee told her mother that, yes, it was true, and that she was scared of Camilla. 
But then when <laughs> when Teresa went through her daughter's room, she found multiple love letters to Renee from Camilla. So it's been alleged quite a few times through this that Camilla and Renee were in a romantic relationship. It's never been confirmed, but regardless if they were or they weren't, Renee was mostly attracted to men. Teresa calls a meeting with the school and Camilla's parents to try to put an end to their friendship, but this didn't work. She then refused to pay her daughter's cell phone bill in an attempt to cut off outside communication between the girls. Because obviously she can't cut off in-school communication, but she could cut off out-school communication. So Camilla went out and she bought Renee a phone so that the girls could continue to speak. So do I think the girls were in a type of romantic relationship? Maybe. Yes. Yes, I do. But I also believe that Camilla was way more into Renee than Renee was ever into Camilla. Over time, Camilla was able to wear Renee down enough that she would decide to break things off with Angus. She's really good at getting in this girl's head. R really good. She's a scary person. After the breakup, Camilla would introduce Renee to her ex-boyfriend, 24-year-old Brayden Spateri. She would tell Renee that she gave Brayden her phone number and to wait for his texts. So that's what Renee did. And Renee would end up hearing from Brayden that night via text message. Camilla had explained to Renee that he could only talk to her through text messages or Facebook because he was currently incarcerated for manslaughter. Apparently, Braden was riding his motorcycle one day and he had his best friend Richie on the back of his motorcycle. There was an accident and Richie was tragically killed. He went on to explain to her that she couldn't visit him in the Goulburn jail because the way that this particular prison works, if you forfeit having visits, you get a lighter sentence. I've never heard of that. But her wonderful friend Camilla called Braden's lawyer and arranged for him to get a cell phone into the prison. But he couldn't talk to her on the phone because he's not actually allowed to have the cell phone in prison. And if somebody hears him talking on the phone, he'll get in major trouble. But his defense lawyer, I guess, liked him so much that he put his life and his license on the line for Braden. That's dedication. And in December of 2011, Braden would contact Renee's mother via text message to introduce himself to her and to assure Teresa that he loved her daughter and that they planned to figure out their relationship after he was released from prison. How lovely. That's just the the text every mother wants to get about their daughter. As soon as I get out of prison, we are going to figure out our relationship. Great. In January of 2012, Camilla and Renee go to a tattoo shop called Bondi Inc. While there, Camilla convinces Renee to get B. Spateri tattooed on the right side of her chest. This is the type of control that Camilla had over Renee and Camilla knew it and she abused it. Then in April of 2012, Camilla would take a vacation to the United States for a month. It just so happens that during this time, Brayden was also having surgery and would not be able to speak to Renee, but he was able to speak to his lawyer, Patrick. 
Patrick would text Renee to let her know that Brayden's surgery went well and that she could expect to hear from him on the 26th. Then in August of 2012, Brayden is released from prison. Great, right? But due to unforeseen circumstances, he wasn't actually able to meet up with Renee. Then in September of 2012, Renee took a overdose of medication. Three days later, she was unable to eat or drink, so she had to go to her mother and tell her mother what she had done. Her mother puts her in the car and rushes her to the emergency room. Doctor's notes from the emergency room read as follows. Boyfriend spent a year in prison and was paroled. Boyfriend had a fight with his father after getting out. Father pressed charges and boyfriend went back to jail for another two years. Patient is upset as she doesn't have contact with boyfriend. Does not feel mentally stable. Says work is a stress. Boss told her that he is in love with her a few days ago. Patient feels confused. She reported her mood as a 4 out of 10 but denied having thoughts of self-harm stating that she regretted what she had done and that she was happy to be alive with no serious fatal consequences. After leaving the hospital, Renee decided to end the relationship with Brayden and to give the relationship with her boss, Ian, a chance. She did, however, remain friends with and continue to speak with Brayden. While she was in the relationship with Ian, she would sleep at his house one to two nights a week, and they would also be together on the weekends. So, it should go without saying that this did not sit well with Camilla. One night, one night Renee was out with a bunch of friends, and Camilla was there. They had gone to a casino for the night. At some point... Her and Camilla had got into a fight, and Camilla pushes her and hits her. It was at that point she called Ian and asked him to pick her up at Darling Harbor. In the days following the incident, Renee decided to change her phone number so that Camilla could no longer bother her. But because she was still in contact with Brayden, it wasn't very difficult at all for Camilla to get the new number. Throughout their relationship, Brayden would send Ian threatening messages. Then in January of 2013, Ian would propose to Renee and she would accept. But Brayden's messages to Ian were still going strong. By March of 2013, Ian gave Renee an ultimatum, telling her that she needed to pick either him or her fugitive ex-boyfriend. Guess who she picked? her fugitive ex-boyfriend and just like that she threw away the healthiest relationship that she's had since regretting the breakup with her first love Angus because she, Renee was not happy about the breakup Renee was crushed about the breakup she she cried to her mother about the breakup but this girl had such a hold over her it was like she did whatever she told her to do she would even end up quitting her job to get away from Ian she did find another job though and she confided in her new co-workers about her relationship with Brayden from this point on Renee was only with Brayden and 100% percent committed to being with him until he gets paroled and they could be together physically in july of 2013 brayden told renee that he wouldn't be able to speak to her for a month because he had a court case coming up <laughs> okay renee would still text brayden daily even though he was unable to get back to her she would finally hear from him again on August 5th, 2013 at 1 p.m. while she was out to lunch with her co-worker at the time. Brayden sends her a text message that says, I think I need a break and so do you. 
Her coworker said that Renee began to cry and shake so uncontrollably that the restaurant staff became concerned and they were bringing her tissues and trying to calm her down. She then turned to her coworker and told him that she wanted to go home. So the two get into the car. He drives her back to their job. Renee gets in her car and she leaves work and she goes home. Phone records show that at 2.44 p.m., she made a 90-second phone call to the jail. But it's unknown if she spoke to anybody and what was said during that phone call. When she arrived home that day, Teresa was home and she greeted her. She could tell that something was not right with her daughter, obviously, because mother, a mother knows. Let's be real. But when she questioned her, Renee told her that nothing was wrong and she just went upstairs to her room. Then a very short time later, Teresa gets a text message from Brayden saying, sort your daughter out. She's threatening to unalive herself. To which Teresa responds, please explain to me why a young woman would want to unalive herself. Ask her yourself. Then he says, maybe explain to me why you never got her help last time. Teresa says, have you ever thought that you are the problem? Seems like it all comes back to your feet. I got her help. Looks like, Brayden says, I'm the problem, am I? Have you ever thought you have neglected her when she clearly needs help? Teresa says, if there really is a God out there, he will answer my prayers. Time will tell. Brayden says, he only answers people that are genuine. Teresa says, Clearly, that's why you are there and I am here. Braden says, yeah, exactly. And that's why he hasn't answered your prayers. I know I'm a good person, but I must be something if your daughter loves me. So, Teresa immediately goes into Renee's room, sits down on the bed next to her, and asks her about these messages. To which Renee replies, Don't be stupid. I would never do that, Mom. You don't have to worry about him anymore. I finally found out what he is all about. Reassured that her daughter was fine, Teresa left to go pick up her other children. When she came back home, Renee was doing her makeup and she was getting dressed. She said goodbye to her mother and told her she was going out to dinner with some girlfriends and that she wouldn't be late and she walks out the door. Teresa asks Renee to take her daughter to Grandma's house before meeting up with her friends so that Teresa could take the two boys to swimming, to which she says fine. Renee was a great kid, but Renee wasn't going to dinner with her friends. She had other plans for that evening. At approximately 5.20 p.m., Renee arrives at a beautiful lookout called The Gap at Jacob's Ladder Reserve, Watson's Bay in Sydney, North South Wales. This beautiful lookout is a spectacular walk that is enjoyed by thousands of tourists and locals yearly, but it is also visited by another group of people. While most tourists are unaware of this fact, Many locals know that this is an extremely popular site for people that have fallen so far into the pits of depression that they feel the only option left for them is to end it all. It is said that The Gap sees about 50 people a year that fall into this category of hopelessness. On August 5th, 2013, Renee Marsden, who had just been dumped by what she believed to be the love of her life for the past 18 months, decided this was the only option left for her. CCTV shows Renee arriving at the lookout. She sends Brayden a text message at 5.22 p.m. She then gets out of her vehicle, walks around the area, and sits down. She sends Brayden five more text messages before he finally answers her at 5.46 p.m. She then sends him another three more text messages, but he never responds. She sends Camilla a message at 5.47 p.m. I'm sorry for everything. You will always be my best friend. I hope one day you can forgive me. I love you. 
At 549, she sends her mother, Teresa, a text message that reads, I love you so much. I'm sorry for everything and the pain I will now cause you, but I'll still be here and be around when you need to talk to me. Just call my name and I'll be there. You're the most amazing person and mother ever and my very best friend. I wasn't happy. I need you to understand that it's okay. Don't let this ruin everyone else you need to take care of, okay? I need you to be strong for me. I love you, Mama. I always will. And I'll be waiting when you come. Renee. At 5.51 p.m., she climbs over the fence and looks over the edge. At 5.52 p.m., she receives a text message from Brandon and replies, but doesn't hear back from him. CCTV then shows her throw her phone into the water at 5.54 p.m. She then shimmies further down the cliff and slips out of view of the camera. After swimming lessons are over, Teresa goes over to her friend's house to show her the text from Renee. Her friend urges her to phone police immediately. Teresa phones Camilla to ask her if she has heard from Renee. She tells Teresa that Renee sent her a text a while ago and asks if everything's okay. When Teresa tells her what's going on, Camilla and her mother drive over to pick up Teresa and take her to a few of the Renee's favorite spots to look for her. They go past the McDonald's and her car is not there. Then they drive to Brayden's sister's home. But when Teresa attempts to get out of the car to go knock on the door, Camilla stops her and tells her not to bother the sister because Renee's car is not even here, so she can't be here. And then she drives off. At approximately 8.45 p.m. that evening, police locate Renee's car on Military Road, which is about 150 meters from the steps of the Gap. Inside the car, police locate a Valentine's Day card, a little montage of Brayden and Renee with the words, I love you, baby, an old iPhone, and I love you, Brayden, written on the window of her car. Two aerial searches are conducted, but they're unsuccessful. Three divers were sent into the water to search, but also turned up empty. A second dive team went into the water the following day, but again, turned up empty. Police concluded that Renee's body had drifted out to sea and to this day, they still have not found her. Two days later on August 7th, Teresa texted Brayden multiple times saying, where are you? I want to speak to you. I want answers now. Answer me, please. You can't do this. But she never got a reply from him. Camilla would later show up to Teresa's home to tell her how upset Brayden was that everybody was blaming him for the death of Renee and that they should go easy on him because he's suffering as well. It should go without saying that this was not received well whatsoever by Renee's family. August 25th, 2013. Police bring Camilla into the station for an interview. By this point, they have reached out to the jail that Brayden's allegedly being held at, and they know that no such inmate exists. When they confront Camilla about believing that she was Brayden, she steadfastly denies this, saying, I know that a lot of people think I am. Everyone is against me. I wish I were where Renee is right now wherever she is. I, I just want to have the peace that she's feeling right now. We could be together. Do you really think she's gone? Okay, cue the violence. Are, are you kidding me right now? You poor thing. September 23rd, 2013. Police execute a search warrant for Camilla's cell phone particularly the one they believed she used in order to pose as Brayden. However, police were unable to retrieve that particular phone or that phone's SIM card. Without having the phone or the SIM card in their possession, they're unable to retrieve the messages because 
back in 2013, phone companies deleted data after seven days. Police seize, police do seize three phones from Camilla that day, a BlackBerry, an iPhone 4, and a Samsung, none of which were a BlackBerry Bold Touch, which was the phone used to catfish Renee. The initial investigation into Renee's death was not seen as a priority by police. I say this because they basically give the family back Renee's phone after months of having it, telling them that they're unable to lock the phone and retrieve the contents inside. And due to the CCTV footage that they have, they decided to close the case and... That's it. It was an unaliving. Okay. So, refusing to give up, Renee's younger brother has a friend that believes that he could break into the phone for with a particular app that costs $100. It should go without saying, obviously, her parents immediately pay the $100. And they say that within minutes, this kid retrieved over 11,000 messages. So that means what police couldn't do in months and months and months, this kid did in minutes. You should be really ashamed of yourself, Sydney police. Her father, Mark, called the phone numbers and found out that Renee was calling wedding venues to prepare to marry Braden after his release from prison. Her father also took all of the messages between Renee and Braden and Renee and Camilla. He got a spreadsheet, color coded them, and tracked it. Genius. This is it's just genius. It's genius what he does. He gets a spreadsheet. He color codes them. So Renee and Bra- uh, Renee and Braden are one color. Renee and Camilla are another color. And He puts them on a spreadsheet. He tracks messages over a period of weeks. Once everything is color-coded and put into chronological order, Mark realizes that out of thousands and thousands of messages, many of them occurring at the same time, they never intertwine. So it would be like a cluster of messages from Renee and Brayden. Then it would be a cluster of messages with Renee and Camilla, but it would never be like Renee and Brandon, and then somewhere in between, Camilla would text that never appeared. So the probability of this happening, I mean, I I suppose it could, but the probability of it happening is extremely low considering there were thousands of messages taking place at the same time when mark sent this over to police they told him that he may be onto something again you should be incredibly embarrassed of your department sydney that these people are the ones that are doing your job for you When police look into this further, they discover that both phones were pinging off the same tower. Camilla was Brayden, and Brayden was Camilla. After Camilla is confronted with this evidence, she realizes the jig is up, and she claims that her and Renee made Brayden up together and on november 7th 2011 they actually went to the store together to purchase the sim card and to activate the cell phone she says the reason for this is because her and renee were in love and they were in a very serious relationship and they knew their relationship would never be accepted she says that the reason that they decided Braden would be incarcerated was because it would be the easiest way to explain to her parents why they couldn't meet him. But this seems incredibly hard to believe, considering Renee had looked into wedding venues, tattooed Beast Pateri on her chest, 
and wrote a letter to the consulate asking if Braden, a convicted felon, would be able to leave the country after his parole so that they can go on a honeymoon. Why would you do all that if you if Braden was really Camilla and you had this plan you guys thought up this plan and you knew the truth the whole time? Why would you do that? Renee confided in co-workers of hers about Brayden and people that had nothing to do with her family or Camilla's family. So why would she need to lie to them about Brayden? Why did she phone the prison on August 5th if she knew that Brayden never existed? Because she didn't. She wholeheartedly believed Brayden was real. So, why would Camilla catfish her best friend do something so awful to someone that she claims she loves? Okay, well, for starters, that's not love. Let's be real. That's not love. I don't believe Camilla ever saw Renee as a person or a friend. I believe she saw her as a possession, a possession that she wanted to own and that she wanted to control. So she made up Brayden in order to help the jealousy that she was experiencing and to make her feel like she had control over Renee while hiding behind the disguise of someone else. Renee may have been bisexual. It, it, it's absolutely a possibility. I, only she truly knows what she was attracted to, but According to her friends and family, one thing is for sure. There would always be a man in Renee's life, even if she decided to experiment with women, because she was mostly attracted to men. By Camilla pretending to be Brayden, it was feeding her need to be in an intimate relationship with Renee. Even though Renee wasn't in love with Camilla, she was in love with an illusion. March 16th, 2013, Renee and Camilla are out to eat together when Renee's ex-fiance, Ian, walks in. The two are still friendly with each other. However, that evening, they don't speak. After the girls leave, Renee sends Ian a text saying that they should get together and catch up. This infuriates Camilla and she hits Renee on the back of the head and pulls her hair. Renee would confide about this incident to Brayden, saying, I think Camilla and I are done for good. Ian was there, and he came and said hello when we were drinking, right? So we got up and left. Then we were dancing. They walked through and stopped and started playing next to us. And we finished, and we got up and walked out, and he was calling me, and I ignored him and kept walking. And she goes, if you fucking turn around, I'll tell Brayden. Out of everything, I was so upset she said something like, after she knows everything we've been through. So she goes, let's go. And we were walking. Then she starts A-B-U-S-I-N-G me in the car. I ruined everything and the rest of the shit and hit me in the nose and was screaming the whole way home because I typed Mar into Facebook and she goes and says Melanie's such a better friend she would never do that it's at the point I don't feel safe around her I hate going out with her and I can't do it anymore I said the last time she hits me again I'm done all she kept saying was you're dead I'm going to fuck kill you I'm going to fuck kill you and gets knocking my head and I can't put up with the violence anymore. March 28th, 2013, Renee sent Camilla a letter for her birthday that read in part, there are two things I'm absolutely grateful for and I would always be thankful and grateful for the rest of my life and that is allowing me and Brandon to start a relationship together. You don't understand, babe, how much it truly means to me. And if it wasn't because of you, I wouldn't have met the one person that means more than world more than the world itself to me. And secondly, for always being there no matter what happens. I only want the best for you, and I hope one day you find your everything, and you're someone that will mean more than life itself and more than anyone or anything in the world. 
I'd kill anyone that would hurt you. Learn from your mistakes, babe, especially the last few months. But you have pushed, showing how strong you truly are. I admire you for that. I'll do anything I can to make sure I can give you what I found. And make sure that person is your all. It's my life mission to see you happy. And my life won't fully be complete until I see the day you have everything you've ever dreamed of. April 23rd, 2013. Renee and Camilla have yet another fight. They later agreed to make a day every week or every two weeks that are strictly reserved for them. April 26, 2013. Camilla advises Renee not to do anything to lose Brayden, to just have some faith in him and believe that when he gets out, he will come and get her. Camilla warns Renee not to go looking for him as something could go wrong if she does. June 16th, 2013, Renee and Melanie, who is Camilla's other best friend, show up to Camilla's soccer game to watch her play, according to multiple people. Camilla made a goal, but because Renee and Melanie were chatting at the time, they missed, they missed it. They weren't paying attention. This apparently infuriates Camilla, and she sends Renee a text that read, Get fucked, you see... (laughs) Okay. Get fucked, you see you next Tuesday. I'm not even talking to her. You're both dogs. It's simple. You can get fucked. You're both. See you next Tuesdays. Ten minutes later, Camilla starts talking as Brayden to manipulate and monitor Renee. Brayden has also been playing a soccer game in the jail that day. Coincidentally, he was playing a soccer game in jail that day. June 18th, 2013. Renee tells Brayden that she's going to start to break away from Camilla. This marks the beginning of the end of her relationship with Camilla, as well as the beginning of the end of her relationship with Brayden. September 2021. Renee changes her phone number and any further communications that Renee has are unknown because... That's when she began using her new phone, and that was the phone she threw into the water. Okay, so let's address how Camilla was able to get a picture of Brayden if Camilla was Brayden, right? Because this made me crazy when I was researching this story. Because of all the press that this story was getting, the person behind the Brayden picture was finally found. His name is not Brayden Spiteri, and he did not know Camilla or Renee. Camilla and the person in the picture were at the same bar together one night, a place called The Brewery. It was that night that the drinks were probably flowing, they were probably chatting, and Camilla snaps a picture with him. And lo and behold, Brayden Spiteri is born. It would also come out that Camilla had a co-worker that was dating a man named Darren Spateri. So it's more likely than not, that's where she got the last name and she simply changed the first name. Okay, so Camilla was brought up on charges for catfishing Renee and the family of Renee wanted Camilla held responsible for Renee's death. This is really tricky case, though, because for starters, there are no rules against catfishing and because no money ever exchanged hands in the eyes of the law, no real crime was ever committed. I disagree with that somewhat, but do you guys remember the story of Michelle Carter? She was dating a boy that was extremely depressed and she essentially bullied him into unaliving himself in his car from carbon monoxide poisoning texting him and talking to him the entire time and at one point he even jumps out of his car because he changes his mind and she tells him get back in the car so he does and he would end up passing away at the age of 18 She received two and a half years in prison with 15 months served and the rest suspended. 
and would only end up serving 12 of those 15 months and five years probation. And there was, and she, she made, not that she made him, I shouldn't say she made him, but she highly encouraged it, dare I say, bullied him into it. And she got next to nothing. At the end of Camilla's trial, the court found that Renee absolutely believed that Brayden was a real person that she had a real connection with and that she was prepared to wait for him. A former co-worker of Renee's testified that Renee told her, if I didn't think he was real, I never would have left Ian for him. In the end, though, the court found that Renee deliberately slipped from the clifftop with the intent to unalive herself after the termination of her relationship with a person whose identity and intent were unbeknownst to her, a fabrication created and perpetuated for the purpose of exercising coercion and control over her by an unknown person who who engaged in conduct known as catfishing. Online lover has left Renee Marsden's family with a heartbreaking reality and a perpetrator who's never been charged. Look, let me go on record as this. Pure evil would be about the best way to describe her. 20-year-old Renee took her own life in 2013 after her boyfriend of two years ended their relationship. But Brayden Spratieri wasn't real. He was a fictional character created by her best friend and former obsessed girlfriend, Camilla Zidon. Under New South Wales law, creating a fake online persona or catfishing isn't illegal. Renee's family are now working to have stricter laws put into place for catfishing and I applaud them for this. I truly do. Harsh rules need to be put into place and people need to face consequences for these actions. Renee is not the first person that has taken her life due to this, and she likely won't be the last. The only thing that all the catfish have in common in these types of stories is that none of them, none of them, have ever faced consequences for their actions. And the only way they will moving forward is if laws are put into place to protect the victims in these situations. Oh, Camilla. Camilla's now happily married with children, living her life as if nothing ever happened. And Renee's family are left with nothing but an empty seat at their dinner table and broken hearts. All right, guys, if you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and I appreciate you so, so, so very much. I really hope you guys enjoyed this one. Let me know. Leave me a like. Leave me a comment. Please subscribe if you haven't yet and you feel so inclined to. Any engagement really, really helps me and I really appreciate it. And until next time, stay safe out there.